Hello, and welcome to our Bible study in the Old Testament books of Ezra and Nehemiah. In this video, I will be sharing some background about these uh, Old Testament books. Uh, one of the things we realize about the books of Ezra and Nehemiah is that they are not uh, often read or uh, preached from in churches, uh, but they do provide a excellent uh, historical uh, picture of what happened uh, to the people of Israel in the moments after the exile uh, ended. When we turn to our context of these books, Ezra and Nehemiah, the most important event that uh, sort of forms the backdrop of these books is the exile itself. The exile, the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple in 586 BC. Now I have described uh, the background to the exile itself in another video on, on Ezekiel my introductory video on Ezekiel, and I will link to that uh, in the description below. But the importance of the exile is that it, it forms the context, the, the sort of entire picture that um, leads the exiles to what they're going to do next. It was a very disheartening blow to a people who thought that God was always going to be victorious and always on their side. And so the destruction of their capital city, the destruction of the temple, and the loss of their independence was a, a very direct blow uh, to their faithfulness, to the idea that God would always be there. And so in the midst of the exile, they begin to understand God in a different way. They begin to understand uh, what God wants from them in a different way. And so when we turn to the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, which talk about the return to uh, Judah, the return to the, to the temple and the city of Jerusalem, it, uh, to, um, their relationship with God is, is conf confronted in a very different, different way. Now, what we see in Ezra and Nehemiah is a new player on the world stage, who is the uh, Emperor Cyrus, who leads the Persian Empire. Now, Persia had conquered Babylon in, 580, in 539, 539 BC, and it is in 539 BC that uh, Cyrus begins his new uh, program of sending the exiles that are in Babylon, sending them back to their homelands uh, to restore their uh, cities, their religion. And he does, and Cyrus does this not only for the people of Israel, but for other uh, subject peoples who have been conquered by the Babylonians. This is part of his policy um, uh, to uh, guarantee peace in the farthest, farthest reaches of his empire. So Cyrus is the first king that is mentioned in this uh, place as a Persian ruler. Uh, other Persian rulers that come up in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah are uh, Darius, who is the king in 516, when the temple is finally completed. He is the emperor of Persia then. And then Artaxerxes I, who is the emperor when Ezra and Nehemiah come on the stage about 80 to 90 years later. So with these three kings, these are the three main uh, events that happen in, this, in the story of Ezra and Nehemiah. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah are mostly about uh, three main leaders, which is often why these books are preached in sermon series on leadership. Now, our three main leaders are, uh, first of all, we have Zerubbabel, who comes to us in Ezra chapter 2 as the leader, the governor of the province of Judah. 
Uh, he is the one who leads the people back in 538 BC. And he is the one who is in charge of the temple uh, being rebuilt in 516. So from Ezra 2 to Ezra 6, Zerubbabel is the main figure that we see there. In Ezra 7, that is when Ezra comes onto the scene. Uh, Ezra as the uh, scribe and the one who wants to bring in, bring back uh, God's law. Uh, Ezra comes on the scene during the reign of Artaxerxes I, about 80 years after uh, the events of Ezra 1 to 6. So Ezra 7 uh, to, to, to 10 are Ezra's attempts to reinforce the Mosaic law, to bring back uh, God's vision uh, for his people and to restore proper uh, worship of in God's temple. The book of Nehemiah is um, about Nehemiah uh, from in, 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 in his arrival. He arrives in about 445 BC and in his, with, with his arrival, we see he's, his task is to rebuild uh, the walls of the temple. Um, sorry, the walls of the city of Jerusalem to provide protection. And so his story is a story of all of the, the battles which he must, must face and the uh, distractions that come in the midst of that story. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah are connected uh, to the books of First and Second Chronicles. Uh, the book of Second and Second Chronicles ends and the book of Ezra begins with the very same um, wording about the decree of Cyrus to return the exiles to their land. The uh, authorship of these books has traditionally been ascribed to uh, Ezra and although we're not quite sure if Ezra was the writer of these books, what we do know is whoever wrote the books of Ezra and Nehemiah had access to uh, Persian court records, had access to uh, some memoirs of both Ezra and Nehemiah, which are put forward. Um, we also have a, a tie-in between the books of Ezra and Nehemiah and the prophetic books of Haggai and Zechariah. Uh, Haggai and Zechariah, who are very instrumental in the rebuilding of the temple during the reign of Darius in 516 BC. And we'll see that in the mid part of the book of Ezra. So what is the basic uh, theology of the books of Ezra and Nehemiah? The first uh, theological points that I'd like to, to bring out that are going to be brought up in this book regard um, the description of who God is in this book. The idea is that there is a continuity with the God that, of the exiles with the God that had made the covenant and the promises with his people in the past. What this wants to tell us is that God is the keeper of promises, that God is faithful to his covenant, that God is the protector and the provider for his people, and that God wishes to be worshipped according to the law that he gave to his people. Now, on the other side of that, we have the idea of who are God's people in this story. And God's people... The, more, the main focus is this return to the land that was promised to them. The return to the land, the rebuilding of the temple, the rebuilding of the city, the restoring of all of the things which they lost in the exile. And that restoration, although it is in no way uh, compares to what they had before, it is a peace of what God's people want. Uh, they struggle in the, in the land, but it is the land that God promised. And although they are struggling, they still know that they are 
within God's uh, power and God's protection. Now, one of the crucial things in this book, and I bring this up because uh, I, I read it in uh, one of my commentaries, to ask why do we read this book? What purpose is there in studying Ezra and Nehemiah? And R.J. Coggins uh, gives two reasons why we should uh, study this book. And the first is uh, for historical reasons. Uh, but the second reason is that he says in his, in, his, in his commentary that we have a claim to be the people of God. Uh, that is our claim as whether we're Jews or, or, or Christians, we claim to be the people of, of God. And his question is, what does that claim mean in terms of identity with and separation from the surrounding world? And that's a question to which we have no easy answer. And the answer which is given in Ezra and Nehemiah, especially with regard to intermarriage, may not be the answer which we want to give in our world today. But it is a question which we have to come to terms with. Especially when we ask ourselves, what does the claim to be a people of God mean? And how is such a people to be differentiated from those sometimes sympathetic, sometimes hostile, among whom they live. How do we maintain the distinctiveness of being the people of God in the midst of a world that is, as Coggan says, sometimes hostile and sometimes sympathetic, just as the people of Israel in their return had to face that uh, same battle? So how do we face that battle, and how do we find our our place distinctive from that, from that world. So that's what this book is going to be about. It is about a people trying to find out their distinctiveness, trying to find again their distinctiveness. And in some ways, it becomes easier for them when they don't have the, uh, the, um, the pressures of government and the pressures of uh, ruling and all they have is their distinction with the people that surround them. I want to close this uh, video with a few words about my own uh, personal views um, about scripture. Now I am a conservative evangelical uh, I do believe in the inerrancy and infallibility of Scripture. I believe that Scripture is our only rule for faith and practice. And it is the authority upon which all the rest of my theology stands. And so my bias, if you will, my, my first uh, turn is always to a more traditional reading, a more traditional understanding of what the text says and what the text means. Now that does not mean that I have not uh, taken it upon myself to uh, add uh, other voices uh, to my study. I have added uh, to my study not only those who agree with me, but also I have been uh, reading uh, resources and commentaries from a more moderate pr perspective or from a liberal and critical pers perspective to get the, the full range of interpretation. And from that, uh, I will present um, those questions. Because there are a, a lot of questions that come up in the midst of this book. Uh, especially re with regards to history, with regards to uh, numbers, with regards to uh, names, and, and, and all sorts of uh, different, different aspects that are there. So although my uh, first uh, turn will be to the traditional interpretation, and for the most part that is probably where I will end up, uh, I, I will uh, bring in other voices when there are issues, uh, controversial issues, that will come up. So, um, 
please uh, continue to uh, study with me in these books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, our next study will be chapters 1 and 2, uh, which will be available next week. Let us pray. Lord God, as we embark on this study together, we pray that your presence would be there to guide us, that we would hear your voice in your word, and that you would open our eyes to see what you want us to see. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.